Hi everybody, uh, welcome to the James Library. I'm Russell Martin, the library director here. So on behalf of the library and uh, student life, uh, we'd like to welcome you to this edition of North Carolina Authors Speak. We have a very special speaker today. She's the Poet Laureate of North Carolina. She is the ninth Poet Laureate of North Carolina. Is in her second term, um, the third female appointee and the first African American appointee. Mm -hmm. So we're very lucky to have her here today. Um, she teaches, or did you tell me you have retired from? I Duke? have retired. I have just uh. retired from Duke, um, where she was teaching a documentary poetry at their Center for Documentary Studies. Um, some of her publications include Dead on Arrival, Conjure Blues. Feeding the Light, uh, Breath of Song. She is also the owner of Sister Wright, excuse me, Sister Wright, providing writing retreats for women writers all over the world, it seems like. Um, she is the poetry editor for Walter Magazine and poet laureate in residence for North Carolina Museum of Art. And was listed on Forbes Magazine 50 over 50 lifestyle list for 2022. So we're so happy to have you here today, and I'll let you tell us some more about yourself. Thank you. What a fabulous audience. So how many of you are here because your teacher told you to come? Are they going to give you credit? Are you getting credit? OK. And I think I have the youngest audience member. <laughs> What's his name? Uh, Arthur. So welcome, Arthur, to I hope your first of many poetry readings. <laughs> yeah, we should instill in children very young a wonderful love of literature and storytelling and, and understanding the power of books. And that's kind of how I started writing as a very young rural child growing up in rural Orange County. Um, yeah, is I knew the world was larger than the sky that I could see. And I wanted to understand that globe that was out there. So it was my love of libraries and my love of books that carried me across that globe before I was actually able to get on a plane and travel that globe. And I'm so glad that, that I did, because I believe that the more that we travel and the more that we understand the lifestyles and the cultures of other people, we understand where our humanities might come together and all of our otherness. So the arts is this incredible, powerful bridge that we all get to stand on. And, inside of all of our differences and all of our othernesses. And when we start telling ourselves our stories over and over again, we find where our humanity connects us. So we look around and we look at people who don't look at us and think, I have nothing in common with that person. It is only when we start telling our stories that we find that we are not unique in our otherness. It's the power of those connections. And that's why I write. I thought I'd do something a little different today. Instead of just starting throwing poems at you, I wanted to ask first, and, and maybe when the little sisters in the back um, decide to show up, I'm up here, y'all, OK? Show up. This is not the time to like talk to each other, right? And that's not a, that's not a calling you out, but it's an invitation to be present. It's an invitation to be present and to receive and to let go. So I'm going to start with asking you, what are your questions? What are your questions that you might have of me before I start reading, which kind of puts this back in, in your lap. But what are some questions that you might have for me as a writer, as a poet laureate? What influences, what directs, what instructs? what inspires my writing. So I'm going to ask you, what are the questions, if any, that you have? Yes. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, what 
inspired you to write poems? What inspired me to write poems? So I'm going to give you several answers. And I'm going to give you the answer that really does instruct the work that I do. Growing up, I never said I wanted to be a writer. Actually, I have never wanted to be a writer. <laughs> and there are days that I still don't want to be a writer. But I'll tell you the story. It's the story that my grandmother would tell me very frequently, especially in the summertime when there was a thunderstorm. For some reason, she told me the story during thunderstorm. So you know when you're a small child and older people tell you the same story over and over again? And you're like, you're just like over it. But you know, it's your grandma, so you can't say to her that you're over it. You just listen. But the story is that my grandmother would tell me is that my grandmother's grandmother's grandmother was the property of the white plantation family that owned my grandmother's grandmother's grandmother, her mother, and her grandmother. My grandmother's grandmother's grandmother was actually the property of the three-year-old little white girl that was her sister, because the slave holder was also my grandmother's 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 father. The white woman married to her father did not like this child for obvious reasons, and he always wanted to get rid of this child, to sell her. She always wanted to sell the child, but the husband would not sell the child because he was, she was his child. The children, and there were many of them, of the white woman, were educated by their mother. She took education very, very seriously, and she would gather her children in a room on a daily basis and teach them the lesson of the day, whatever that was. The woman was a very stern woman. The white children had secretly taught their half-sister, my grandmother's grandmother's grandmother, secretly taught her how to read and write. Why was that problematic, anybody? Okay, one perspective, another perspective. Yes. African American was not allowed to have knowledge. It was unlawful. It was against the law for any enslaved man, woman, or child to be literate, to know how to read and write. It was against the law. So the children, because they are children, did not understand the ramifications of how serious this was. So there is a day that where my grandmother's grandmother's grandmother is present in a room where the white mother is teaching her children the lesson of the day. And this woman, like I said again, is very, very stern about her children learning. Whatever child she called on had forgotten or did not know the correct answer. All the children looked to my grandmother's grandmother's grandmother, who was the oldest. She was nine years old. And she blurted out the correct answer. On that day, it was discovered that this enslaved child could read and write. On that day, my grandmother's grandmother's grandmother was beaten pretty severely. She shared a bedroom with a little three-year-old. Wherever the three-year-old went, my grandmother's grandmother's grandmother was always there to make sure that child was taken care of, but more importantly, that she had a companion. But on this day, she was taken from the three-year-old. She was banished from the plantation house. She was sent to live at the edge of the plantation with an elderly enslaved woman who had outlived her service. They were just waiting for her to become an ancestor to transition. Now the white mother has her big opportunity to get rid of this child, and she does. My grandmother's grandmother's grandmother is sold to a neighboring plantation just a few counties away. On the morning that the new owner arrives to carry this child away to his plantation, my grandmother's 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 mother is running behind this old wooden wagon, screaming and crying, that they not take her child away. And as she's running, a rusty nail falls from the bottom of the old wooden wagon. My grandmother's grandmother's grandmother's, my grandmother's 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 mother, a lot of grandmas, y'all, picks up the nail, she puts it in her pocket, and she keeps it. She keeps the nail. Many years later, my grandmother's grandmother's 
grandmother's mother, buys her child out of slavery. That nail has been passed down on the matrilineal side of my family. I have that nail. I believe that what we keep keeps us. What we keep keeps us. So my grandmother told me, you can forget about wanting to be a scientist or an oceanographer. All my life I said I wanted to be an oceanographer. I was fascinated, I still am fascinated with the bottom of the ocean and the life of the ocean. I want to be a mermaid, really. But um, <laughs> my grandmother said, get, get rid of that notion. She said, your job is to tell. The power of utterance, the power to tell. She said, you will tell the story, you will write. Your job is to write and to tell. And I didn't understand that. But she said, someone who looked just like you nearly lost their life because they could read and write, just because they could read and write. She said, you will take this mission of your ancestors and you will tell the stories, you will write the stories. So that's one of the reasons that I write, the simple story from my grandmother. Sometimes we, we think we're going to start out on one life's journey and sometimes our life work finds us, right? So I have a lot of friends who are surgeons and scientists but on weekends they are rock stars they're in like their basements or their garages with their bass guitars like rocking it out or at the local pub you know so sometimes our life work finds us so that's really why i work why i do this work so all my life growing up in the rural south going to church uh and i liked church when i was little it was just too long it took too long. It was like, can we go home now? Like, do y'all do have to sing another song? Like, how many prayers y'all need to pray? Right? Can we just go? I now understand that nosiness that I had as a child. Poets need to be nosy. Artists and writers really need to be nosy about the world around us. So because I was very nosy, my grandmother would give me little notebooks in church to keep me quiet. She said, write your little stuff in your little book. And I would. And I would write about life around me. So that's the long answer for your question. Uh, is everything inspires me. The natural world, the chairs in this room. When people tell me, you know, I've run out of things to write about, I'm like, then obviously you must not be breathing anymore. As long as you breathe, there is sufficient, adequate material for you to write about. Write about your shoes. Write about where they've been. Write about the stories that they carry. Write about the earth that they've walked across. You know, we're walking across life every time we take a step. There was something here before us. Any other questions? Yes. What do you focus on in the work? What do I focus on? So my work primarily over the years has come out of a container of writing about living in the South, living in the rural South, growing up in the rural South, the, just, the juxtaposition of politics and, and race uh, and inequity, politics, um, and also just the stories of what it means to live in an environment as a Southerner. So a lot of Southerners, I'm a documentary poet. So how many people know what documentary poetry is? Anybody? So at the Center for Documentary Studies, for many, many years, I've worked with documentary photographers, videographers, filmmakers, documentary writers. And that means using primary or secondary sources to frame or retell a historic or personal narrative. So a lot of poets when Katrina happened, you guys, that was before you all. Most people in the room, that was before you, right? The storm, Katrina. I keep forgetting how long ago it was. So uh, we can go back to World War II. We can go back to even more historical things. There are poets who have taken these historical moments and reframed them in poetics, OK? So using sources, what are some primary sources? How do we document ourselves every day? Anybody? Huh? Journals, how do we, yes, how else? 
photos. photos, birth certificates, death certificates, your campus card, your driver's license, Video. hmm? Video. videos. So we're all documentarians. We don't think about this. Every time you take a selfie and put it on social media, it's a documentation. And don't think that documentation disappears. There's a rabbit hole that captures all of our information, right? All of it. I mean, I'm, I'm getting spooked every day by, it's almost as if I think I want a pair of blue sneakers, just thinking it. Ads started showing up for the exact blue sneakers that I thought about, didn't type in a search for, but thought about them. A little spooky. Any other questions? And I promise I'm going to read some poetry, but... Question? Okay. I saw you raise up like there was a question. Yes. What were the first thoughts you had when you got uh, appointed the North Carolina Laureate? So, um, my birthday is Juneteenth. And that morning, my cell phone rang, and it was... Not a number I knew, but it was a local enough number that I thought maybe I knew who it was. So I answered the phone, and this voice said, hello, this is Roy Cooper calling for Jackie Shelton Green. And me being the smart behind that I am, I said, yeah, right. Like, my governor, Roy Cooper, like, really? And he said, really, this is your governor, Roy Cooper. <laughs> and I was like, oh. I said, how may I help you? And he said, well, I'm calling to inform you that I've just appointed you as the ninth poet laureate of North Carolina. And I screamed in his ear. <laughs> it was really bad. You know, like I did that, that, that like ugly cry, screaming, <laughs> screaming, crying at the same time, jumping up and down, running around in circles. Yeah, that was my response. Um, so I was very humbled and very honored that um, that my peers, that a selection committee. So the year that I was nominated, there were close to 3,200 uh, nominations for the Poet Laureate of North Carolina. Those nominations go to a committee that screens them and they send three to the governor's office and the, gov the governor personally selects the person. So I was very, very honored. The very next morning, I get on a flight to Morocco in North Africa. And the governor asked me not to tell anybody. He said, but you can't tell a soul until our PR marketing department can put it all together and do a, an appropriate, you know, PSA. I was like, cool. So I told my husband, he said, you can tell your husband, you can't tell anybody else. Did we tell the kids? No, we didn't tell the kids. We didn't tell anybody. And uh, get to Morocco, get to um, Casablanca that I fly into to get to my home where I'm going to in. And Morocco and uh, I'm traveling with a woman and she's sitting across from me and she's going oh oh my god oh oh and I'm thinking great what has happened so I rush over you know and I'm taking deep breaths and I'm like okay calm down tell me what happened at home you seem really distressed right now like what's going on and she's like oh you're the poet laureate of North Carolina and I went yeah no and she was like, you know. I said, I couldn't tell anybody. She slapped me. Um, and I was like, how did you know? She said, my kids are calling me. She said, my kids are writing to me. She said, they're sending me. She said, it's all over the place. And I thought, he told me not to tell anybody. <laughs> well, you can't keep a secret in North Carolina. I'm sorry. So cat's out of the bag. And you know, I'm getting phone calls from everybody, New York Times, because I'm the first African-American poet laureate in the state of North Carolina. Everybody is calling me. Uh, and I'm running around this airport trying to find a hot spot because I can't hear what they're saying. Get to Morocco, get to the village I'm going to, and the young students have, uh, in Arabic, written on the wall coming into the village where my house says, welcome our poet laureate in Arabic. So even it was, you know, it had hit international news by that point. So I'm very honored. I remain very honored. This is my uh, sixth year. Uh, and I will remain the Poet Laureate until the governor is gone. And we don't know what's going to happen if I'll stay the Poet Laureate until a new governor arrives. 
and appoints a new one, which will take probably another year, or if I go when the governor leaves. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I'm going to start reading some poetry. Uh, and we can, you can ask me more questions, but I don't know. Spirit told me today to ask you for questions first. I spoke about my grandmother. I write a lot about my grandmother. And this is a poem that I wrote for her many years ago when I actually was working with a group of women on death row at the North Carolina uh, women's prison. So not only do I work with universities and people all over the world at the college level and high school students and elementary school students, but I am most happy when I'm working with people in homeless shelters, when I'm working with disenfranchised writers, writers who would not be sitting in this room, uh, who might come to a library only for shelter, um, those voices, those silenced, erased, invisible people have stories also. And I am always humbled and honored to work with them and to bear witness to their stories. So I worked with this group of women on death row for an entire year. And I don't know if some of, some of the people in the room, everybody in the room is so young. All y'all are so young. Even the faculty are so young. But how many people remember Miss Blanche from Alamance County? Remember Miss Blanche? Miss mm. Blanche, like, was killing up all her husbands. That's what landed her on death row. Uh, I mean, she just kept marrying them, and they kept dying. Well, Miss Blanche was in my class. Miss Blanche was scary. Uh, all the other women came every Monday night in their orange jumpsuits, but Miss Blanche would show up in like a little knife pleated skirt and a little cardigan and a little shale and her white pearls and her pink frosted lipstick and she was always well coiffed. I mean her hair. I was like, how does Miss this lady get the royal treatment on death row? But she did. She called everybody honey, sweetie pie. Uh, but we all wrote about our hands. For an entire year, I only allowed them to write about their hands for one entire year. I wanted them to think about the power of their hands that had landed them for an alleged or real crime that they were serving on death row. This is a piece I wrote for my grandmother thinking about her hands. I know the grandmother one had hands. I know the grandmother one had hands but they were always in bowls, folding, pinching, rolling the dough, making the bread. I know the grandmother one had hands, but they were always underwater, sifting rice, bluing clothes, starching lives. I know the grandmother one had hands, but they were always in the earth, planting seeds, removing weeds, growing knives, burying sons. I know the grandmother one had hands, but they were always under the cloth, pushing it along, helping it birth into skirt, dress, curtains to lock out night. I know the grandmother one had hands, but they were always inside the hair, parting, plaiting, twisting it into rainbows. I know the grandmother one had hands, but they were always inside pockets, holding the knots, counting the twisted veins, holding on to herself, lest her hands disappear into sky. I know the grandmother one had hands, but they were always inside the clouds, poking holes for the rain to fall. So, you know, growing up in the South, the South is very complicated, very complicated, layered, layered histories. And all of our histories actually connect to each other. So there's not a white Southern man in this room that can really talk about legacy or historical uh, connections without talking about my story, right? Connections, connections. There are no red people in the South that not, cannot talk about their connections to white and black and brown people. We're all connected. 
I also believe that there's a crisis in Southern, in Southern memory, a crisis in Southern memory, a collective amnesia that we sometimes buy into, right, as Southerners, the pretense that we will have, right? But I grew up in a family where I learned as a very young child that many people in my family were white enough to pass. How many people read Nail Larson's Passing or saw the movie Passing? Yeah. So in my family, um, I knew these stories as a child. I didn't really know what they meant. But I'm going to read two poems, one poem that I had forgotten about, not forgotten about, but I hadn't planned to read it, but I'll read it too. So it starts with a photograph that used to sit on my grandmother's piano. And as a child, I would, would circle that photograph quite a bit, because it's a very distinguished, older man, blonde, beautiful blue eyes, the sepia print, so his eyes, you could see his eyes. And I would stop as a child and go, who is that? And nobody would answer, like nobody would ever answer. When my grandmother died, and we were sitting in the living room, and <clears throat> Southerners of a certain age know that you did not go into the parlor except for certain special occasions, right? You didn't go into, the, our living room was like Mother's Day, Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, and somebody died, right? Like the parlor or the living room was where we didn't gather. We gathered in the den. Now y'all call it the great room. But it was the den. That's where we hung out. But I remember we were sitting in the living room, and I was sitting next to my uncle. And I looked at him, and I looked at the picture, and I was like, okay, who is that? And he said, that would be your great-grandfather. I was like, oh. Oh. So being the documentary poet that I am, I went down a rabbit hole because I wanted to know more about this person. I also wanted to know more about those women who, the only time they showed up in our lives would be when an elderly black person in our family died. They would come under the cloak of darkness. So being that nosy little girl that I was, and the other thing that happened when somebody in our family died, for whatever reasons, we showed up at grandma's house. Everybody showed up at grandma's house, and you slept wherever you could sleep. Like everybody was like, why are we at grandma's house? We have a house. But we showed up at grandma's house when somebody died. These women would, would come to the back door, to the back door that had a tiny screen porch, tiny knocks in the middle of the night. And I heard them for a long time as a child. But when I hit about 14, I was pretty bold. And I remember creeping out of bed, and I knew how to get to the back porch without being detected, right? And there they were, two women who could very much identify and did identify every day as white women, beautiful, blonde hair, blue eyes. And I was bold enough to even crack the door to hear what they had to say. And my grandmother was whispering saying, you shouldn't have come, this is not, this is too dangerous. And they were crying saying, but we had to come. Aunt Emma died, we had to come. So they would come when someone died. So I'm going to read this piece that I've written about these women as I've researched who they were. A ransom of bones. These bones, these bones, touch them gently. For their blackness have been known to pick the locks of hidden rooms, empty rooms, open doors. I have been this way before, passing as the exotic, exotic foreigner denying the color of my gloved hands, turning away from the dead incantations of slaves, their voices rising, heaving through my throat, almost telling my secret. O oh, spirit, blow on me a slave wind, a night of stolen rapture, bleeding my name from the river where my blood is born. O oh, spirit, Ritualize the collapse of a black woman's sap, like the annual flow of the birch interrupted by a white man's decision. O oh, spirit, forgive me for the unfurling of unfamiliar fabric and unfamiliar rooms that forbid morning to enter. I am the one locked away, the one paid for in foreign currency, the currency of deceit. 
500 peso a year to change the water at the altar. 500 peso a year to remember to forget a slave mother dying, crying veiled tears. My spirit returns, crossing dark slave thresholds, speaking through muted smoke before collapsing beneath my mother's fire. I have lost track of my secret in this dance. I have lost track of all the other skin I've worn. The calculus of my sins becomes sweet whispered drama for the keepers of the secret. I have swallowed all the keys to all the doors that keep me. O oh, spirit, touch these bones gently when they appear as screams, crossing borders, singing dirges in familiar tongues, revenge, sacrifice. I travel to this myth of home as transparent as faith, as transparent as the myth of white face, white neck, white arms, white thighs, transparent as blue eyes. 500 peso a year for the privilege to whisper. But these swallowed keys jingle, threaten to strangle me with the story of betrayal, the story of a black girl who walked through the love light of her mother's eyes, becoming the story of a white woman living on the edges of night. 500 peso a year, 500 peso a year. I pay my own skin for the price of a key, a room, a rape, a birth. 500 peso a year, 500 peso a year, 500 peso a year. I pay for this nourishment, this spicy soup of antebellum. I pay to commit these sins of the tongue, to keep me white, alive, locked away in freedom's dusty cubicle, locked away inside someone else's journey. 500 peso a year to anoint these bones with the secrets. I weave to reset, to reseal the lock, protect the unfurling, unfamiliar, fabric of memory. 500 peso a year to grow old, sit behind gloves, become the bondsman's daughter, counting the tornadoes I will unleash, painting my lips with the colors of somewhere else. O oh, spirit, bury these bones under a forgiving sky. Feed them the holiness of sunlight, the holiness of breath. 500 peso a year, 500 peso a year to sharpen my nipples, their language, memories of another freedom. Wait for the return of the bondsman. 500 peso a year to lock away what it is he must never remember. The darkness of my body, offering up questions he cannot answer. The darkness of words that spill all over floors, stain chairs, eat into curtains, Paint the walls with the tongue of his seed. I joyously pay to write these other betrayals, to kiss memory back into my bones. These bones, these bones, touch them gently, for they have been known to dig themselves into sky, under skin, turn light into sharp crystals, walk across fire, turning this denial of blackness into noose tight, intact, still within reach, breathing, disguised as river, needing a new ransom. So sometimes people will say, do you ever write anything that's not so heavy? No. So, you know, James Baldwin instructs us that writers should write about the times that they live in. Artists should make art about the times that we live in. So this era of political politeness, I'm sorry to tell you, has kind of come and gone. It is a time for truth telling. Is it a time, it is a time to think about history in the context of not history that is history, but history that is present. History that is present. A revisitation 
of many things that we should not be revisiting that are very, very present. So how many people know about the Wilmington Massacre of 1898? Few people in the room. So last year, one of the things as a writer, long before I became the Poet Laureate, but one of the things as a writer, and I'm often commissioned to write poetry for a specific occasion. So uh, last year, I mean, yeah, last year was a huge commemoration of the 1898 Wilmington Massacre. And I was commissioned to write a piece. So I'm gonna write this piece. I'm gonna read this piece that I wrote for, for that commission, which required that I do a lot of research I mean, I've known about the 1898 massacre of Wilmington pretty much all of my adult life. But it's another thing when, when you're gonna write about it, right? Is actually being able to have source material and primary material. There's a lot of primary source about the 1898 Wilmington, Wilmington massacre. It's another thing to be in that space and thinking, am I standing in a space where someone was shot down Am I standing in a place, right, where someone was trampled upon? So there's a Wilmington massacre. massacre. I've also been to um, her James Brown up to, to Virginia, uh, John Brown and Nat Turner's uh, rebellion happens. We don't think about how when we stand on, in spaces that we're always standing on sacred land. You just don't know what happened in that place or that space. We walk across history every day. You know, I often show up at places like this and say, well, what was this before it was the, the community college? What was this acreage? What lived here? What thrived here, right? Who fed at the riverbanks here? You know, what waters run through here going to the Atlantic? All of these questions that we don't even think about because we're obsessed with kind of living in the now and being present to what's immediate. But history is never not here, just because we don't see it. Some of us can hear the ancestors, some of us actually hear them, can see them in spaces. And Native Americans who are in a lot of our riverbanks, they're spirits, right? Slaves who made their way from one part of North Carolina, moving northward. They were here. They're still here in us. So this is a piece that I wrote for the commemoration of an 1898 Wilmington Massacre. When black men die, the earth forgets to shudder. Stars refuse to forget who they were that day. Wind and thunder, measured everything they lived and died for. Not a blade of grass refused the blood that would become a season of wailing blood trees. Blackbirds sang out loud to a sky that looked the other way. When black men die, the earth forgets to shudder. When black men die, a million sunrises lose their balance, remembering that a black man is a whole universe. When black men die, the whispered tears of mothers cry out. Were my prayers loud enough? Should I have prayed more? Did I pray to the right God? When they found the bodies, eyes remained wide open, reminding their children of their precious hearts where hate refused to grow. Eyes still holding glassy, blurred reflections of the terror they'd endured, forever mirrored in their dark gazes. Wilmington, 1898, was a black nation unto itself, burying its dead, but not its history. Alex Manley knew that his written words scorched deeper than the flames white men would cast upon his newspaper. Words of truth stung, singed, turned Southern myths upside down. We are the ones they continue to speak through. We are the ones deciphering the bloodstains inside their shadows. We are the ones calling their names. If you listen closely, you can still hear the words of Dixie covering their death streams, their death screams. For Dixie's land, we take our stand. 
Dead men spoke through the smoke, whispering that the Lord's work was not complete. Words of Frederick Douglass still resounded in their ears. The white man's happiness cannot be purchased by the black man's misery. White men planned necktie parties while black men feared every sunrise in their children's eyes. Black men on November 10, 1898, chewed the bread of the Constitution of the United States for breakfast, which declares that all men are born free and equal with certain inalienable rights. White pulpits passed out bloody Bibles and blessed the glory of white supremacy. When these black men died, we raised up their names. Charles Lindsay, William Muzan, Samuel McFallon, black man named Bizell, Sam Gregory, Daniel Wright, Josh Halsey, John Gregory, Sam McFarlane, Tom Rowan, black man named Perkins, Carter Piemon. Morning came with their blood walking through the air and even murderous white men could not silence their ghost screams or the bleeding shrews of sheep, horses, and pigs that understood the language of slaughter. Mothers, fathers, daughters, sons, brothers, sisters could not rush to bury their bodies. Their stretched out bodies were empty vessels for the earth. Grief itself was afraid to roam. White men without sympathy filled the angry pulses of their corrupt heartbeats. White men, white boys murder with all the callousness of a cat biting through the heart of a baby bird. Black men become birds without wings, carrying the extra weight of white men's fears of not being free in their own Dixie. Cursing blackness was a Southern white man's battle cry. This Southern land, this Southern land, restores itself in the wound of injustice. This Southern land, where the sun slipped its rim into the cascade of hills on November 10, 1898. Thousands of hearts opened wider, crossed over, then crossed back into Wilmington, honoring the promise of their ancestors to build a land where their children could safely roam. This Southern land writes the name of the free in blood. Listen, hell has windows and doors. Listen to the screams of Charles Acock, who cannot deny us the right to vote any longer. Listen to the prayers in the ashes of Claude M. Bernard, who wants to forget that he failed to indict white men for murder and coup. Listen to Thomas Clausen, still clamoring white supremacy from the four corners of his own sword in hell over and over again. Curse their names, curse the history that celebrates them. Captain Donald McRae, Hugh McRae, Colonel Roger Moore, George Roundtree, Daniel Russell, Colonel William L. Sanders, Fernifold Simmons, J. Allen Taylor, Lieutenant Colonel Walker Taylor, Pitchfork Ben Tillman, Colonel Alfred Moore Waddell. Curse their names, curse the history that celebrates them. When black men die, we rise up. When black men die, we rise up. We are here now, today, remembering the names of Abraham Galloway, William Henderson, Edward Kinsley, Reverend Alan Kirk, Alexander Manley, Carrie Manley, Thomas Miller, George Henry White. We are here now, navigating a terrain of freedom where all children are accepted and loved. We are here now, completely alive inside the complexities of our intersecting histories and herstories. We are here now, not to escape, erase, or invisible the memories, but to soothe the trauma of generational wounds with truth. We are here now, offering the poetry of healing. We are here now, holding up our ancestral stories of brutality, kidnapped, raped, branded, transported, shackled down, but still here, still here. We are here now to tell you that Black Wilmington resurrected hope, planted freedom songs and weapons of joy inside the shoes of their children. We are here now, reclaiming, redirecting, 
redeeming these Wilmington streets that study war no more. So, any questions? Comments? Yes. I would like to know how you chose poetry rather than writing a novel. Or, you know, you seem to have quite an interesting history of your own. Um, I love the economy of language, even though a lot of poetry is long and I write a lot of prose poetry, that last piece. But I really like the economy of language and like really uh, challenging myself to be descriptive and, and you know, you can, s it's kind of like when you get that email that's three paragraphs long, you're like, you know what, this could have been two sentences. <laughs> that's kind of how I charge myself to think about poetry sometimes, is like how can you make that hook? Because if you don't hook somebody in the first three sentences, like when we're watching a movie or reading a novel, if you're not hooked immediately, like we're over it. It's like, okay, I know where this is going. I already know what the ending is going to be. We stop reading or we stop watching. So for me, it's always been about the exactness of language. Um, and finding myself inside descriptions and really the textures. And, and for me, when I'm writing, it's very visceral. I have a dance background. So usually when I'm writing, I'm choreographing, if that makes sense. I mean, like I kind of can hear the words. Words have to taste right in my mouth. They have to feel good when I'm saying them. Uh, that may like be far-fetched, but, but yeah, they have to, they have to taste right, right? Like, if you're going to put something in your mouth, like you know what it is you want to exude, if that makes sense. Any other questions? Yes? Um, do you read any other poet's work? And if you do, um, do you get inspired and do you implement their way of writing into your own? No, I don't implement other poets' way of writing. Uh, I remember, uh, that's a good question. Many, many years ago when I was living in New England, I remember a man came to a reading I had and he said, I have a question. He said, I want you to read a poem as a black woman. Then I want you to read a poem as a woman. Then I want you to read a poem as a southerner. Then I want you to read a poem as an American. Like he had like his litany of lists. And I was like, dude, I am all those things, right? And then he proceeded to tell me, well, you don't sound like, at that time, people only knew like three poets' names, Maya Angelou. And Maya Angelou is like never really called herself a poet as much as she has a novelist, even though she's written a lot of poetry. But at that time, in the early 70s, like we knew Alice Walker, Maya Angelou, and Nikki Giovanni. Maybe Sonia Sanchez, if you're in the right setting. But folk didn't know. Harlem Renaissance black poets, or they hadn't read them or studied them. He said, and you don't, by the way, you don't sound like Nikki Giovanni or Alice Walker or Maya Angelou. And I was like, thank God. I said, and they don't sound like me either. They're not supposed to. You have to have a relationship with your art. So I have a relationship with my voice. I have a relationship with what I write. And I'm real clear that I own what I write. And that is uniquely my voice. Sometimes do I maybe sound like another poet or other poets may see? Yeah, that happens. But I read other poets because I'm fed by them. I'm fed by their language. I'm fed by nuance. And it's always exciting. Like, you know, there's so much literature in the world. I'm always exciting when I, excited when I read a poet. I'm like, I wish I had written that. Or like, I could have written that, you know? So I might find myself inside of another writer. What I don't do is co-opt that writer's voice or material, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I love to read other poets. I you know, I've been reading a lot of, there are a lot of um, poets from the 1800s and the early 1900s that we don't even know about. So I've been going back reading a lot of older poetry, a lot of contemporary poetry. And not only that, but we kind of get stuck on American literature. So ever since I was in my 20s, every summer, I give myself a task of reading 
reading the work of another writer from another part of the world. So one summer I spent like a summer reading only Italian collections of short stories, maybe two or three Italian novels. Then I spent a summer on all Middle Eastern women poets, one summer on e Egyptian novelists, one summer on, on Asian poets. That's how we show up in the world, is experiencing what's out there. You know, I come from a, t from a tiny town like this. There is a world beyond us. And I know all about going to Walmart on Saturday. There, there, there is a world out there. And one way that we find out about that world is reading. Reading. Reading and experiences the life stories of other people in other cultures. And I'm also stupid enough to believe that the more we know about people in other cultures, the less closed we will be as human beings. And the more open we will be to embrace. Like, I hate to tell you all this, we may have come here in different boats. Like, a lot of your ancestors may have come through uh, Ellis Island right? On the Mayflower. Some of our ancestors may have come through the Middle Passage or in dinghies. But we're here now in the same boat. Like it ain't no, it's only one boat, y'all. And we're all in it. And I hate to tell y'all this, but like when I don't have fresh air, you ain't gonna have none either. When my water is contaminated, you're not gonna have like some fresh water pumped in. I don't care how much money you got. Mother Nature does not work this way. And she's continually telling us how we have to save our planet. We are in this boat together. It is no longer about petty politics and territories and gas and land. It's about the survival of us, our humanity. So I employ all of us, you know, to think about when we're like inside of literature, how literature can really be a wonderful place of healing and resetting what it looks like to show up differently as we move through life, right, with our planet. When COVID happened, if you were paying attention, if you listened, what was metaphorical about COVID is that it took your breath. It took our breath. COVID took our breath. Right? And if you were outside where it was very, very still and quiet, you know, when we shut everything down, you could actually hear the earth breathing. There are no airplanes in the airways. We stopped. People weren't moving around in their cars as much. You could hear her breathing. What did she say? I can't breathe. I'm taking my breath back. I'm going to take a breath now. Y'all been taking all, my, all the breaths, right? With petroleum and everything else that we've contaminated with. So I do go off script a little bit. It's okay. But that's the role of the person at the mic, <laughs> is to be a truth teller. Truth telling is also dangerous. I live a very dangerous life. Truth telling is dangerous, and that's what we get to do inside of poetry. You know, it's where we get to talk about the things that are not so fun to talk about, or don't feel good to talk about, or uneasy to talk about. But inside of poetry, inside of stories, right? That's where we learn to be at ease with our humanness. So thank you for, for that question. Did I, did I answer that for you? Okay, I know it was a long answer. Anything else? Any other questions? I'm paying attention to time. Yes. How do you encourage people to talk about generational racism and blindness to the prejudice that was taught for generations to families when you have someone who was able to get out and bring some awareness back but people aren't ready to face history or to face change? Well, I always say this. If I were white and somebody invited me to a workshop on how not to be a racist, I wouldn't go. I ain't showing up. I wouldn't go. Because I don't believe that it is necessary to clobber people over the head. I think we start somewhere else. 
And we start with that conversation I was having about commonality, you know, like finding where we connect, right? And affirming the connectedness, confirming the humanity. I've worked with clan, with the clan. I've worked with a lot of white supremacists. I had an interesting situation that happened when I first started out as the poet laureate. So y'all know Biscuitville? So Biscuitville sent me an email. You know, at first I thought it was junk mail and I almost like deleted it. Except I saw, saw Dear Miss Shelton Green. I was like, why is Biscuitville writing me? They want to give me a biscuit as the poet laureate? So I know. <laughs> so I go to the email. Dear Ms. Shelton Green, congratulations on being the first African-American poet laureate of North Carolina. We here at Biscuitville celebrate black history every month, uh, blah, 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 blah. And we produce a bookmarker. And this year, we decided we would like to celebrate you on our bookmark. Um, so this woman had a great sense of humor. She said, she said we always celebrate um, African-Americans who've, who've contributed to the society. And she wrote in parentheses, usually dead old black people. <laughs> she said, but you're very, very much alive. We would like to celebrate you. And uh, she said, and on the flip side, Nina Simone will have her picture. So a little blurb about me, a little blurb. So I was like, okay, sure. So I get this phone call. Hey, Ms. Shelton Green, would you consider doing a poetry reading at Biscuitville? I thought, a poetry reading at Biscuitville. I was like, okay. Eight o'clock in the morning. So we get to Greensboro to this Biscuitville and there are cars everywhere. And there are like four news trucks. And I'm like getting really freaked out. Like, like surely these people didn't come. Cause I, cause, I mean, I was really freaked out. I walk in, the entire staff of Biscuitville, they're all dressed up in their clean white uniforms. It's like a reception line all the way to the biscuits. And there are people everywhere and I'm like holy crap and there are news cameras in my face it went really really good hey Miss Shelton Green that look went really good can we do that next Monday morning same time same place <laughs> I was like okay so I show up again there are more people because those folks that came last Monday they went home and they told everybody else plus the coupon is a free sausage biscuit <laughs> so Oh, we would like to have the North Carolina A&T Poet Laureate, and I'm going to answer your question, the North Carolina A&T Poet Laureate to speak before you. I said that would be great. So you all, there are Poet Laureates at the college level. It would be wonderful if you all had a Poet Laureate of your school. There are Poet Laureates at high schools. That's my initiative. So that's something we can talk about. It would be fabulous if you all had a Poet Laureate of your college. A&T Poet Laureate, uh, she spoke before me. While she is talking, four guys come in with the Make America Great Again caps. They come in and they're like looking around like, whoa, you know, like look at all these people. And they get their food and they go sit down and I'm facing them. So I see this guy pull out his coupon and he's like, and he looks up at me. Then he's like talking to his boys. And they're all looking at me, holding up the coupon. I was like, okay, I wonder how this is going to go. Um, so I do my reading, and everything is over. And I'm standing by the door saying goodbye to people. And here come the four guys. They walk straight up to me. So the first guy says, hey, is this you? I went, yep. And he was like, wow, how about that? So he goes, where are you from? And I'm thinking, I'm not telling you where I'm from. And I said, oh, I'm just a little old country girl. And he said, like us. I said, yeah, like us. And I'm emphasizing us. I said, yeah, like us. So the second guy says, this is really cool. I said, yeah, it is, isn't it? He said, I, I love it when good things happen to ordinary people. I said, yeah. I said, this is wonderful. So, um, this other guy says, wow, my wife is going to be so angry. And he said, she's not going to believe we met the poet laureate at Biscuitville. So this other guy who hasn't said anything says, well, she'll believe us if she'll take a selfie with us. So I said, okay. 
almost like there was a secret c communication that I didn't see. But like in unison, they took off their caps and they threw them on the bench behind them. And then they're fussing about who's going to stand next to me, right? So we take the picture. And then this other guy who hadn't said anything, he pulls out of his pocket a stack of the coupons. I'm taking these to my young school because next week's Black History Month. They're going to love these. I'm like, what planet? <laughs> I mean, it was like, all right, okay. So as they're leaving, they put their hats back on. And the first guy, he looks at me, he gives me a hug, and he says, keep on making us proud. And I said, I'm going to do my best. And they left. Well, here come the black students from A&T State University. They are mad with me. Michelle Green, have you lost your mind? Why would you talk to those guys? I mean, like, we don't believe you stood there and took a picture with them. And I said, well, since you witnessed the entire thing, I said, then you went this, and number one, they approached me. But they had on those hats. I said, well, their hats, their hats are not my business. My only business is my response. I said, I'm 70 years old, I've been around a block. I know what's genuine and I know what's not. Good old white boys try to pull my leg every day. I know what that leg pulling feels like, looks like, sounds like, right? I said, that was genuine. I said, see, the MAGA hat wearing guys in my neighborhood, if they had found out all those people were there for a black woman, they would have walked out, number one. They wouldn't have accepted the coupon, they probably thrown it on the floor. I know my MAGA guys in my neighborhood. They wouldn't have like stood for it. I said, that was real. My response is the only thing that matters to me. Now, did I change who they were? No. I said, but they came to me decent. They were cordial. My response requires, what I require myself is to respond to civility. And that's what I did. I said, so in that moment, what connected them was when I said, I'm just a little old country girl. And they said, like us. Where do we find our commonalities? That was just an, an organic, right, meeting. Thank you for sharing the story. So I tell this story because we have to stop judging the package, right? And in this day and time, it's all about branding. We can brand ourselves in so many different ways, but we don't know what people are carrying or what their stories are. So how I approach what you're talking about is sitting in humanity with that person first, not even bringing out, like, I'm like, how can you talk about race all day and never use the word race? There are, there are ways. There are ways to talk about Inequity, it starts with asking people, when was the first time you were ever othered, erased, invisible? And if you have never been erased, othered, and invisible, if you live long enough, you will be, right? You walk into a room and people make up their own stories or narratives about you based on the car they saw you get out of, what you're wearing, how you wear your hair, right? They're checking you out. People make up their own narratives about you and know nothing about you. So we have to think about that. How we, and we all do it, right? We all do it. How do we not do that? How do we not do that is walking up to that person, you know, like being comfortable with not being comfortable. I love strangers. You know, and some of the best relationships start. I have a, a friend that I met in the bathroom at Whole Foods. We're tight. <laughs> Her husband, my husband, were standing out like they didn't know they were waiting for us. They had struck up a conversation. And then we come out. And like, what were you doing? We were, like, we were talking. You know, next week we're having lunch. How do we step outside of our safe zones, right? To find out who people are. And I have found that inside of my love of writing and this journey of being the poet laureate, because I believe that as I move across the state, it's not just me talking about craft 
and my love of literature and being an ambassador of the literary arts, but being an ambassador for humanity. And that's what literature brings us, is other people's humanity. So I thank you for being a fabulous audience. I thank you for your questions. I thank you for your, your energy, your time. Um, and if there are no more questions, I guess you guys can get away from me. <laughs> Y'all can run back. It's So Thank you. Today. We're such a treat. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody, for coming. So happy to see all of you here. I hope you'll come back to other events that we have in the future.